Are you recording what we do? Yeah, I will. Yep. Okay, so starting with the endocrine system. All right, so let's think about the nervous system first. Um, if you remember the nervous system, we have a neuron, right? This is the synaptic terminal of the neuron. And then we have the synaptic vesicles, and then they contain a neurotransmitter. And what neurotransmitter have we primarily been talking about? ACH, right? So then ACH gets released into the cleft, right? And it goes over to the next cell, whether that's another neuron or a cell in your body, and it binds to a receptor on a gated channel. It causes the gated channel to open up. And if it's a sodium gated channel, which it primarily is, sodium moves in, right? Moves into the cell. And then that causes um, a graded potential. If it's a cell or um, a, um, an action potential, if it's like a muscle cell or another neuron. Okay, so that's, it has a, this neurotransmitter here. Um, and ACH is only one of the neurotransmitters in your body. You also have norepinephrine and epinephrine and dopamine and serotonin and a whole bunch of other ones. But it has to travel a very short distance, right? Very short distance to get where it has to go. Well, the endocrine system, this is a system that's going to release chemicals too. There's many different tissues in your body that are endocrine tissues, and they're going to release chemicals. But those chemicals are going to be called hormones, right? So they're hormones. So what <laughs> happens here is we'll have a, an endocrine tissue. So this will be like an endocrine cell, okay? And the endocrine cell is making a, these hormones, right? And then the hormones will get released into the interstitial space. So it's just in between the cells. That's what interstitial means, in between the cells. And then from there, they're going to diffuse into the blood. So now we've got these chemicals in the blood. All right. Now these chemicals, these hormones, are going to travel through your blood system until they find their receptors. Okay. So they all have different receptor areas, okay? So, um, you know, um, the thyroid gland. The thyroid gland kind of, you know, is going to the, release uh, thyroid hormones, I should say. Thyroid hormones are going to go to just about every cell in your body. Um, but there's some other ones that are very, very specific. So we're going to be talking about all the different hormones and what their target areas are. Maybe they target cells in the kidney. Maybe they target cells in the um, pancreas. Maybe, you know, so there's, there's a whole bunch of different target cells. So <laughs> as far as how far does the endocrine, well, how far do hormones have to travel? They're going to travel a long way. So they have to travel a very, very long way before they get to their receptor site. So they're in a lot of danger once they get into the blood. Okay? Once they're into the blood, they can easily be broken down. So one way that they stop from being broken down is they'll bind to a plasma protein. So one of the plasma proteins that we heard about, you know, um, remember we had, um, we didn't really talk about plasma proteins so much yet, correct? Not yet. We will. We will soon. But um, a plasma protein like an albumin or a globulin. But these are, they'll just, they'll um, bind themselves to these plasma proteins. Now when they're traveling through the blood, if they're bound to a protein, they're less likely to get broken down. If they're not bound to a protein, they're going to get broken down pretty easily. All right, so that's one danger that that um, hormone has. Okay? The other thing is that the hormone um, is going to have to go, it, it might go through the liver before it gets to its tissue, before it gets to its um, its target before it gets to its target cell. So if it goes through the liver, so there's the liver right there, <laughs> um, that liver wants to break things down. It breaks chemicals down so that they, they inactivate. It inactivates um, hormones. It inactivates drugs. So if it has to go through the liver, it's going to get broken down. So there's another danger for that hormone. Now, if it's, if it's lucky, what it's going to do 
is it will finally bind to its target organ, to a receptor on its target organ, and then it's going to cause that cell to change somehow. Okay? Um, the hormone will either cause um, the permeability of the cell to change so that ions can come into the cell, or it's going to change an activity that's going on inside the cell, right? So let me, um, I'll show you some examples here of that. First, let me show you all the different endocrine um, organs that we have that we're going to go over. Some of the endocrine organs and tissues, their only job or their primary job is to be an endocrine organ. It's to produce hormone. That's its primary job. Those things are um, the hypothalamus, the pituitary gland, the thyroid gland, adrenal gland, the pancreas, the pineal gland, um, the parathyroid glands. Those, their job, their primary job is to produce a hormone that will then get into the blood and go to a target area and cause something to happen, right? Then we have some other um, organs and tissues that that's not their primary job to produce hormone, but they do produce hormones um, as a secondary function. So things like the heart. We know the heart's job isn't to produce hormones. The heart's job is to pump blood, okay? But it has a secondary function. Secondary function is it's going to produce these hormones. Okay, then there's the thymus. Its primary job, you know, um, is going to be to um, get the um, lymphocytes, T lymphocytes, to mature. You know, but we're going to go through each one of these. But it will also produce hormones. Adipose tissue. Its um, primary job is protection, but it'll also produce hormones. Um, digestive tract. That's to digest foods, but it also produces hormones. Kidney. It filters the blood, but it also produces hormones, right? And then the gonads. The gonads are primarily to reproduce, um, but they also produce hormones. So those they all have secondary functions. So as we go throughout this um, chapter, and we're going to get into the biggest meat of it next week, um, we're going to go through each one of these tissues and look at what hormones do they release, and then what is the target organ of that hormone, and what happens at that target organ? What happens when that hormone gets to that target? All right, so um, in some very general terms, um, we have to look at a little bit of chemistry behind the hormones, not much, thank goodness. But um, hormones can, can either be um, in three different categories chemically. So they can either be really, really small in that case, they're an amino acid. Amino acids are really small. So we put a bunch of amino acids together. If we link them together, what do we get? A protein, right? So an amino acid is really small. Um, so there's, there's some there. We're going to talk about that briefly. Or a hormone can be a peptide hormone. So a peptide, a polypeptide, are amino acids linked together. So a peptide hormone could be a hormone that has 200 amino acids linked together. Okay. Um, or we have these lipid-derived hormones. So they come from a lipid. Um, they have, they are, they have, um, and since they are lipids, they can actually get through the cell membrane pretty easily. But those are the ones um, that are derived from lipids. So let's look at each one of these just quickly. Not a lot of stress with this, just a little memorization. This is the amino acid. Again, the amino acid, um, these hormones are really small. And so they can typically get into the cell. They can get into the small protein channels and get inside the cell. And then they can um, actually bind to something inside the cell. More, you know, they're going to bind to some organ, uh, sort of some organelle inside the cell. Okay? Um, thyroid hormones, that's an example of an amino acid hormone. And then um, these things are called catecholamines. Um, epinephrine is a catecholamine. Okay? Epinephrine is a catecholamine. So that also is really small. So that's an amino acid. Now let me let me um, tell you this because we talked about epinephrine and norepinephrine, right, in the nervous system, and we said that epinephrine and norepinephrine 
that they were neurotransmitters, right? That was the neurotransmitter released in the sympathetic nervous system right at the effector. That's what made the eyes dilate. That's what made the heart start beating faster. That's what made the lungs start breathing faster, right? So, but that was released from a neuron. That's why we called epinephrine at that point, we called it a neurotransmitter. Now we're looking at epinephrine being released from a gland. Then it's going to be called a hormone because it's not released from a neuron. It's released from a, uh, an endocrine organ, an endocrine gland. Okay, so same chemical, just released from a different place. If it's released from a neuron, then it's a neurotransmitter. If it's released from an endocrine gland, then it's a hormone. Okay? All right, so anyway, that's an amino acid derived hormone. Then we have the peptide hormones. The peptide hormones are bigger. Again, they could be made up of 200 amino acids long, um, they could be as small as nine amino acids, right? So they can be either, either really small but, or bigger, but they're all bigger than the just amino acid derived hormone. Um, so really, um, what I really want you to know about the peptide hormones is just about, let's just say that the peptide hormones come from the pituitary gland. The pituitary gland. All the hormones from the pituitary gland are peptide hormones. And then we get to the last ones, and these are the lipid-derived hormones. And lipid-derived hormones can either be eicosanoids, which aren't this isn't in your notes, or they can be steroid hormones. Okay? Um, they're made of a lipid. Lipids can go through the phospholipid bilayer of the cell, so they go into the cell. Okay. Um, so this is um, eicosanoids. Um, some eicosanoids are things like leukotrienes, prostaglandins. They cause inflammation. So. We're not going to spend any time, you're not going to be tested on the eicosanoids, but you'll hear of eicosanoids. You'll hear about prostaglandins, you're going to hear about leukotrienes, and that's going to be a big part of, um, you know, pain, uh, the whole pain and inflammatory process that you'll learn as you go on with your medicine. And then here's the steroid hormones. This is the one that we're going to talk about a lot. Now, steroids, when you look at them chemically, they always have four rings. So whenever you see something that has four rings on it, if that's a steroid, more than likely. Um, so the steroid, these are these steroid hormones are hormones that we when you hear hormone, you normally think oh testosterone or estrogen, right? So that's what these are. They're estrogen, testosterone, progesterone, and they're also cortisone or cortisol. Okay, cortisol comes from the adrenal glands. We're going to talk about that. So if you want to remember anything from lipid derived, just know that they're steroid hormones. Steroids are lipids. If you go back and look at your chemistry. All right, so let's see what happens once that hormone reaches its target. So once it reaches its target, it can do um, a couple of different things. Okay. So here's a hormone. Um, now, this hormone is not able to get into the cell. Okay, so this hormone is going to bind to a protein receptor in the cell membrane because it can't get in. So, and hormones are like a lock and key. So the, the hormone has to fit perfectly onto the receptor. That's how those hormones know when to leave the blood and when to go to their target organ because they need to fit like a lock and key. If they don't fit, they're back in the blood and moving on. So in this case, what we have, the hormone binds to the outside of the, um, to a receptor on the cell membrane and it's going to change the permeability of that cell membrane. There's a little bit of activity that you don't, you don't need to really discuss on the process of how that happens. But this hormone binding to that protein causes another gated channel to open up, and then calcium comes in. Right? So this is an example of calcium and ion. Um, it's increasing the permeability of calcium. Okay? So that's just an example. Um, if it were epinephrine and norepinephrine, maybe it's increasing the um, permeability of the sodium. Okay? So it's, it's um, increasing the permeability um, to 
uh, an ion. So that's one example of how a hormone works at the, at the target. Here's another example. Now, you look up at the top and you see the four rings. That means it's a what? It's a steroid. That means that it's derived from lipid. So this one easily diffuses. It just diffuses right through that phospholipid bilayer of the cell membrane. And um, it's going to bind to either a receptor in the cytosol, um, which will then go into the nucleus, or it will go right into the nucleus by itself and bind to a receptor once it's in the nucleus. Once the hormone gets into the nucleus, it's going to cause the DNA to produce proteins. Okay? It's going to cause it to produce proteins. It's going to stimulate a gene in the DNA so that it starts going through transcription. And then you're going to get a new protein. So let's look at an example of this, right? So a, what a steroid hormone, let's say it's an anabolic hormone. Um, what's an anabolic steroid hormone? What does it do? What is it? So, an, so well, an anabolic, anabolic steroids. Do you guys know football players take anabolic steroids sometimes illegally, like they're not supposed to, right? Anabolic. So what does an anabolic steroid do? It builds muscles, right? So if this were an anabolic steroid, it's going to come into the nucleus and it's going to stimulate that gene to start producing more myofibrils so that the muscle cells start getting bigger, right? So that's what, it, that's what an anabolic steroid would do, okay? Estrogen, testosterone, they do the same thing, right? That they do the same thing. Um, they're going to cause muscle growth, right? Okay. <clears throat> then, right. Um, that is 18-4A. Yep. So for like steroids like that, what does someone like go on? Because I've like heard about like you know people dying from it and like uh, mutated cells because of it. What are like long term? Like why does it affect and mutate the cells? Is it because it's um, just like kind of defending against what your body naturally has? Well, it's um, <clears throat> long story. It's a longer story. Mm -hmm. But it's it's in your it's affecting your DNA, okay. and so that's going to you know it's going to increase protein production. If the protein production that's being produced is abnormal, then you get like a cancer situation. Right. So I mean, there's there, there's um, a lot of components to that. Yeah. Okay, here's another example. Um, so this is this is um, a thyroid hormone. Okay, there's a thyroid, looks like a dumbbell there, okay, it's a little handheld dumbbell. That's a thyroid hormone. The thyroid hormone, remember, that's an amino acid. It's tiny, so it can get in through a little leak channel. It's going to get in, and it's going to bind to the mitochondria. So it binds to the mitochondria, and it stimulates the mitochondria to start working. What does the mitochondria make? ATP. Makes ATP, right? So... Making ATP is, is like setting your metabolism. ATP is necessary for your cells to do their job. So that's what metabolism is. It's your cells doing their job using ATP, right? So if we had a case where um, a person had too much of that thyroid hormone, then that hormone would be abundant in the cells, would be uh, attaching itself to many mitochondria, causing increased APT, ATP production, right? So what do we see in a person that has too much thyroid hormone? We, we say that they are hyperthyroid, right? They have hyperthyroidism. How do they present? Really thin, right? They got so much ATP, their cells are constantly working, working, working. They have no time to store any of the nutrients as, as fat. So they're very super thin, right? Now what happens if we have a person that has not enough thyroid hormone? Now not enough mitochondria are being stimulated, which means they're hypothyroid. They don't have enough ATP being produced, right? So now the cells can't use the nutrients, and it's going to store the nutrients. And they're going to, as fat, and they're going to appear, their appearance will be heavier, right? So that's what happens with the thyroid hormones. 
So those are just a couple of examples of what happens um, with hormones. Do they bind to the cell membrane and increase permeability? Do they get inside the nucleus and increase protein synthesis? Or do they get inside the cytosol and increase like ATP production? So they, that's what hormones can kind of do once they reach their targets. All right, so the next thing we're going to do, and then we're going <clears> to <throat> um, end with this, but it's, it's um, a longer part. So uh, we're going to talk about the hypothalamus. And then when we start up again next week, we're going to start by really taking a look at the hormones that come out of the pituitary. Right? So the hypothalamus, we said, was part of the diencephalon. Remember, the diencephalon had the thalamus, the epithalamus, the hypothalamus. So here's the hypothalamus. It's kind of a quad rank, quad, quadra angle, right? Is that what the ge geometrical term is? Quadrangle? <laughs> Quadrilateral. Kind of a quadrilateral shape, right? All right, and um, there's three different um, roles um, that I'm going to show you that the hypothalamus does. Now, for this test coming up, we wanted to know that the hypothalamus helps to regulate body temperature. It helps to regulate body fluids. We're not going to even get to that stuff until next week. So um, what I'm going to show you now is more like the physiology of the, the hypothalamus. All right. So the hypothalamus is attached to this gland down here, which is called the pituitary gland. And it's attached by this stalk, which is called the infundibulum. Okay. The pituitary gland has um, um, different lobes to it. There's the anterior lobe, there's the posterior lobe, and then there's an intermediate lobe. And all of them have very different functions. So we, we have to talk about the function. The hypothalamus controls the posterior lobe, it controls the anterior lobe, um, and it, it, it controls the whole pituitary gland in different ways. That's what we're going to talk about. All right. Um, so these one, two, and three, you can't see number one up there so well, but let's, I'm going to start over here with number three, because number three um, we already know about. We already talked about this in this unit that you're going to have an exam on. So the hypothalamus, can, or the, the hypothalamus controls the sympathetic output to the adrenal medulla. All right, so let's go back and look, think about the sympathetic nervous system. Remember, we saw the spinal cord. We saw the preganglionic neurons coming out of T1 to L2. We had a short preganglionic, a long postganglionic, and it went out to all those organs that we saw on the side, right? It went to the eye, it went to the heart, went to the lungs, went to the digestive system, it went to all those organs. And I said there's one exception to having a short preganglionic and a long postganglionic, one exception in the sympathetic nervous system. I said that's going to the adrenal medulla. Going to the adrenal medulla, there's just one long preganglionic neuron, and then it'll cause the adrenal medulla to release norepinephrine and epinephrine. So there's no postganglionic neuron, right? Well, that's controlled by the hypothalamus. So this is that long preganglionic neuron going to the adrenal medulla, causing the adrenal medulla to release norepinephrine and epinephrine into the bloodstream to cause sympathetic activation. Then what happens is norepinephrine and epinephrine are in the blood, and now they can go to all of those organs that we saw. It can go to the eye, it can go to the heart, it can go to the lung, it can go everywhere once it's in the blood. You guys remember that exception? Okay, that's the one exception. So it's the hypothalamus that controls when we're going to send um, that output out through the sympathetic um, nerves. When are we going to send it out through the sympathetic preganglionic nerves? Okay, so that's number one. That's that's one job that the um, that the hypothalamus does. Okay. The next thing, I'm going to jump over here to number one. The next thing that the hypothalamus does is it produces two hormones all on its own. It produces two hormones that are called, one is ADH, and one is oxytocin. 
ADH and oxytocin. So there's neurons. This is the hypo, this is the brain, right? This is neural tissue. So the cell bodies of these neurons are producing ADH and oxytocin. The hypothalamus doesn't release that though. Instead, ADH and oxytocin will travel down through the axons of those neurons until they get to the posterior lobe of the pituitary. Then the posterior lobe of the pituitary will release ADH and oxytocin out into the blood. And then those, cell, those hormones have to reach their targets. So let's talk about each one individually, and we'll talk about what their target is. So ADH and oxytocin, they're produced in the hypothalamus, but they're released from the posterior lobe of the pituitary, okay? ADH. ADH is called the antidiuretic hormone. Anti diuretic hormone. Okay? So, you guys, do you know what a diuretic is? What does a diuretic make you do? Pee. Makes you urinate once you get rid of fluids. So, an anti diuretic is going to do the exact opposite thing. It's going to make you want to retain water, retain fluid. Okay? So, you're retaining fluid. Um, and so, when ADH gets released from the, hype, from the posterior lobe of the pituitary, what gland do you think it's going to target to get you to retain water instead of urinating it out? Mm -hmm. Bingo. The kidneys, right? <laughs> so ADH is going to target the kidneys, and it's going to bind to the tubules in the kidneys, open up the water gates so that you start reabsorbing the water back into your body, instead of urinating it out, okay? So ADH targets the kidneys. When do you think ADH would be released? When do you think you need fluid? When you're losing fluid, obviously. When you're losing fluid, that's when you're gonna need water to be reabsorbed. When is that? What conditions? Okay, if you're dehydrated, um, how do you become dehydrated though? Sweating, all right, so if you're sweating profusely, ADH is going to be released. What else? Not drinking enough water. Sure, not drinking enough water. Blood pressure drops. Okay, and how are you losing volume of fluid? How do you lose? Vomiting and diarrhea. So anytime you are losing fluid, you're losing water, vomiting, diarrhea, sweating, ADH is going to get released from the... Um, posterior lobe of the pituitary so that it targets your kidneys and your kidneys cause you to reabsorb that water. It doesn't want you to urinate it out. So your urine then, you're going to have less urine volume and it's going to be more highly concentrated, right? High concentrated urine, okay? Right? Because you're reabsorbing the water, you're not necessarily reabsorbing all the solutes in the water, so your, your urine is going to be really concentrated with those solutes. All right, oxytocin. So oxytocin gets released from the posterior lobe of the pituitary uh, for different reasons in the male and the female, right? In the female, oxytocin is going to be released in a woman in labor. Oxytocin, in general, is a contractor. It causes the contraction of smooth muscles. So oxytocin will cause the woman's uterus to contract so that she can have the baby. You know, the baby will be born. And number two, um, when a woman is lactating or nursing, she's breastfeeding, it will cause the glands, her mammary glands, to eject the milk. They're contractors. Oxytocin is a contractor. Contract the mammary glands, the milk comes out. Contract the uterus, the baby comes out. Okay, so it's a contractor. In the male, oxytocin is going to be released um, during like ejaculation because it's going to cause. The, um, the tubules that the sperm are in, it's going to cause them to contract, and it's going to move the sperm closer towards the penis. So it has a role in both the male and the female. All right, so that's our ADH and um, oxytocin, and we are going to revisit ADH again and again and again and again <laughs> throughout the semester. Throughout your nursing, you will hear about ADH constantly. 
There are some, you know, disorders where um, ADH gets um, produced excessively. Okay, it's getting produced excessively. So now you're having a lot of reabsorption of water. There's some where it's not getting produced enough. So you're going to hear a lot about ADH. All right, so then the last thing, and so I'm going to go over probably by 10 minutes <coughs> what I said I would do. But um, the last thing is that the hypothalamus produces um, regulatory hormones. These are hormones that regulate the anterior lobe of the pituitary. They regulate hormones from the anterior lobe of the pituitary. Right? So, um, in other words, the hormones from the, the regulatory hormones from the uh, hypothalamus will cause the um, anterior lobe of the pituitary to either release hormones or to not release hormones. So it's, it regulates, it controls the anterior lobe of the pituitary, right? Now, um, first of all, um, when we looked at ADH and oxytocin, we saw that they traveled down to the posterior lobe of the pituitary by neurons. They went through the axons. With these regulatory hormones, they're going to go through a little portal system. You know, think about a boat going from one port to the other, so it's a portal system. It's a little tiny capillary bed where the hormones of the hypothalamus, they're in their own port, they can travel through this little capillary bed, this little blood vessel, and then they get to this other port called the anterior lobe of the pituitary. Right? So it's a little portal system. They get carried through this blood system. Once they're in the anterior lobe, those hormones are going to be released. And they're going to cause the cells in the anterior lobe of the pituitary to release other hormones. So it's a cascading event, right? Hormones here cause the release of hormones here. It's a cascading event. Okay? So um, there's several different hormones in the hypothalamus. Um, it's, it's important for you to remember or to memorize their names. And then to memorize what hormone it is. That, that gets released from the anterior pituitary. Okay. This is a good time to be bringing out those, um, those cards, those index cards, because you have to know the cascading event. Okay. So the hypothalamus is always going to have, it's a regulatory hormone, the hormones being released there are going to end in RH or IH. Those hormones from the hypothalamus are either going to be releasing hormones, where they cause the anterior pituitary to release hormones, or they're going to be inhibitory hormones, where they prevent the anterior lobe from producing hormones. So anytime you see RH or IH, at the end of a, at a hormone, that means it came from the hypothalamus and that it's a regu regulatory hormone. Okay. So um, quickly, you know, and this isn't a big part of this chapter. I, it is a big part, but I don't focus on it so much. It's just memorization here. You have to know that the thyroid releasing hormone that's in the hypothalamus will cause the thyroid stimulating hormone in the anterior pituitary to be released. So one hormone causing the release of another hormone. Then thyroid stimulating hormone is going to target a gland. What gland do you think the thyroid hormone, or the thyroid stimulating hormone targets? <coughs> the thyroid, right? So it then binds to that thyroid. And then it's going to cause the thyroid to release more hormones. So we're going to talk about the thyroid and the hormones next week. Right now, um, I want you to be able to try to memorize the cascading effect. TRH from the hypothalamus causes TSH from the anterior lobe to be released. Okay. Here's <coughs> CRH of the hypothalamus causes ACTH of the anterior lobe to be released. CRH stands for corticotropic releasing hormone. RH tells us that's from the hypothalamus. Okay. 
RH, RH, RH. That tells us it's from the hypothalamus. CRH causes ACTH to be released from the anterior lobe of the pituitary. ACTH stands for adrenocorticotropic hormone. So the anterior lobe releases adrenocorticotropic hormone. Where do you think it's going to target? Adrenal. Adrenal, adrenal cortex to be specific. So we'll talk about the adrenal cortex next week. Okay. The next one, gonadotropic releasing hormone, GnRH. RH, it's released from the hypothalamus. It will cause the anterior pituitary to release FSH and LH. FSH is follicle-stimulating hormone. LH is luteinizing hormone. They're going to go to the gonads. Gonad, go, you know, gonad releasing hormone. Okay, so the FSH and LH then will go to the gonads. What are the gonads in the female? Ovaries, what are the gonads in the male? Testes, okay? All right, we're almost done here. Hang on. Uh, so uh, this, the pituitary makes like, um, <coughs> it measures like how much there is in the blood and then the, the actual gland is going to produce like a, a, yeah. a, a different amount, like a lot of yeah. hormones. Yeah, that's, see, that's, that's exactly what happens. You know, we have that blood-brain barrier that's around all of the brain. Well, there's one area in the brain where there's not a very good blood-brain barrier, and that happens to be around the hypothalamus. So the hypothalamus can detect hormone levels, right? So if it detects that, say, the thyroid hormone is really low in the blood, then it'll start producing the thyroid releasing hormone, causing the thyroid stimulating hormone to get released, causing the thyroid to release thyroid hormone, bringing the thyroid hormone levels back up. Right? So it's all, it's like on this negative feedback system. Um, so the hypothalamus is really sensitive to what the um, levels are in the blood. And if the levels of hormones are low, then the hypothalamus kicks in and, and gets them being produced. Yep, exactly. Okay, um, here's some other ones we need to know. From the hypothalamus, um, here's PRF and PIH, okay? Um, P stands for prolactin. RF stands for releasing factor. Why isn't it releasing hormone? Because we just don't know the chemical makeup of it, so we call it a factor, not a hormone. It's the same thing. So PRF is going to cause the anterior lobe to release prolactin. PRF, prolactin releasing factor, causes the anterior lobe to release prolactin. Prolactin targets the mammary glands, the breast glands, and causes them to make milk. So then you start producing, the, the breasts start producing milk, right? And then we said that oxytocin was needed to eject the milk, to have that milk wet down so she could actually um, release the milk, right? Okay, well, sometimes we see um, um, milk being produced from mammary glands when they shouldn't be, and a woman isn't um, lactating or in a man, right? That could possibly be like a tumor affecting the anterior lobe of the pituitary and causing prolactin to be released, right? So that's one of the symptoms that we sometimes see with pituitary tumors, okay? They, is that that um, leaking of milk from the breasts. This other one is prolactin inhibitory or inhibiting hormone. Prolactin inhibiting hormone. So that is, again, it's IH, so it's from the hypothalamus. That will actually prevent the anterior lobe of the pituitary from releasing prolactin. Okay? Because a woman doesn't produce the milk constantly. She produces it, and then it's stored until it's, it's used, and then she'll produce it again. Okay, So she doesn't produce it constantly. 
So that's PIH and PRS. And then finally, we have um, growth hormone. Growth hormone also has uh, a growth hormone releasing hormone and growth hormone inhibitory hormone from the hypothalamus. So GHIH and GHRH. <coughs> Produced in the hypothalamus causes the anterior lobe of the pituitary to release growth hormone. So what do we know about growth hormone? What does it do? It makes things grow. What does it make grow? Especially cartilage, right? Cartilage and um, bones, right? Cartilage and bones. So it's stimulating cartilage and bones to grow. It actually targets the liver first to produce another hormone that's going to stimulate that. Okay. So, but that's you have to you have to before we can get into all the individual organs. I want you to understand that flow. Hypothalamus causes releasing hormones that cause the anterior lobe of the pituitary to release other hormones. Okay. All right, so any questions on that? Any questions on this part? Okay.